Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, I'm delighted to greet all those gathered for this important premiere. I welcome this opportunity to highlight, through the eyes of my country, Nigeria, one of the main challenges the world is facing. We may live in an era defined largely by remarkable new technologies, but we still face challenges that plague the ancient world, none more debilitating or indeed preventable than hunger. Many regions and countries face severe food insecurity, but the problem is most prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa. 31% of the continent's people are affected. In Nigeria, more than 14 million people are undernourished, and these numbers are astounding. Climate change and poor agricultural practices are exacerbating the problem. We can see this from the inadequate cereal harvest to the declining number of fish in the Niger Delta. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development points the way forward. Food and agriculture figure prominently in this vision. But this will require a major push. Governments need to adopt more ambitious policies and investment plans that focus not only on agriculture, but also on poverty, hunger, and resilience to climate change. We have the opportunity to end hunger within our lifetimes. This is one of the greatest legacies that we can leave to future generations. Let us continue working towards a world with zero hunger. Thank you for your support and commitment. Now, please enjoy the film. Thank you. Food is life. Food is celebration. Food is culture. And food is found in everything we do, in all our ceremonies. Food is a huge thing in Nigeria. I mean, most of our cultures and our traditions, births, deaths, celebrations of any and every sort involve food. When you broker peace between two uh, warring parties, you make them eat together from the same plate and drink together from the same cup. Even how we show care and hospitality, someone visits you, you don't offer them food or drink, it's a message. Food is the center of community. It's everything, that's why in Nigeria, Food is the core of our culture. I, I think my favorite Nigerian dish has to be jollof rice. It's pounded yam and banga soup fish. When you take off other rice with some liver in it and some really well prepared fried uh, uh, meat, you can't beat that. It's eba or gari. Then when I take that with okra soup, mine, I may as well be in heaven. Pounded yam and egusu soup. Draw soup, of course, grass cutter. Ask any Nigerian who makes the best jollof rice and you have a long animated discussion. It usually ends with Nigeria or Nigerian mothers crowned as champion. But ask what may happen when there is no rice or tomato to make jollof, and you may be met with silence. Food security is reliable access to sufficient, affordable, nutritious food for everyone. If any of these elements are missing, food insecurity can result. We have moved from 45 million in 1960 to about 193 million today. By the year 2050, we will be well over 400 million. It is mind-boggling. Traditional farming has been overwhelmed by changing weather patterns, out-of-date methods, and a significant increase in the demand for food. For decades, gaps in production have been countered by food imports. It became daily easier to import than to produce. So agriculture died. And so virtually everything we earned from oil simply went to service importation. A drastic drop in oil income since 2014 and near 50% evaluation of the Naira highlighted the risk of dependence on external sources. 
But replacing imports with local production to save foreign exchange presents a challenge. Much needs to be done if long-term food insecurity is to be avoided. Education is an all-time low. So, I mean, it's got a huge population of young people under 25. Infrastructure is also a really big issue. It's been destroyed over the last few years. Climate change is even bigger. Coming together, that's sort of like your perfect storm. By far the biggest challenge is the quality of infrastructure between the rural areas where the food is grown and where the food is mostly consumed, which is in the urban areas and in the cities and in the state capitals. Perishable food spends uh, three to four days trying to get somewhere where it should be consumed. We have about 40% post-harvest losses in the country. Why should this happen? In a country where there are some people looking for food. They can't store the food because they don't have the electricity and storage systems where the farmlands are. Farmers still do things manually and it's hard to be efficient farming that way. The climate change is affecting agriculture already in this country. Farmers are not sure when the rainy season starts and when it ends. And if you don't know when the rains are going to come, when they're going to stop, it affects the planting and harvesting cycles. So that's a big challenge to our farmers. It rains heavily. And all the water goes into the Atlantic Ocean. Every raindrop that enters a stream is finding its way to the rivers and out into the ocean. Now the ocean doesn't need more water. We need it. With irrigation, we can move from one to multiple harvests per year. We can't keep doing things the same way at the rate our population is growing. If we continue as is in terms of farming and making sure we, we produce enough food, we're never going to have enough. The farmer must be willing to relent. They must understand the fact that it's not like farming that was done in the past. Farming has changed. The challenges facing us as a, as a country and as a region are humongous. And fundamentally, we have no time because reality is population is going up. Uh, and then land is actually coming out of the system due to erosion, salinization, desertification, and urbanization also impacts that as well. The farmer of today in Nigeria is a smallholder farmer. And fundamentally, the farmer of tomorrow is going to be that smallholder farmer. The smallholder farmers have to have a way to make money off of whatever farming industry ends up happening in rural areas. Otherwise, you're going to have massive unrest and massive inequality. Nigeria is already a country that has huge amounts of inequality, where the top 1% own the vast majority of the wealth. I think agriculture is an opportunity for us to get that right. Smallholder farmers um, do not have access to the cash to pair with their hard work to buy the quantity and quality of inputs to be successful. We are able to deploy a system where we're able to raise debt to support thousands of smallholder farmers and do it in a financially sustainable way. I guess kia kamunzo mo bongo na zua kani mo paishi ba wana abonye onda ba kuwa ezisi ayi ba kaba. As a financing institution, reality is that you often see a lot of risk in smallholder farmers, and the truth is there are risks, but those risks can be mitigated. As as has been seen by the fact that we've been able to, over the last six years, achieve a repayment rate of 99.99%. A goosey soup is like a creamy melange of nuts and greens, and it's, it's almost always surf and turf, so you have quite fishy elements, um, from crayfish, and then you have the meats, sometimes which could be beef, chicken, slightly fishy, full of leafy greens, egusi is, is a perfect match. The fundamental challenge holding back the agriculture sector in this region is low level of farm productivity. You know, a farmer in Nigeria has to be able to compete with a farmer in other parts of the world. And if you look at the key staples that we produce, a farmer in Nigeria is getting yields that are 20% of farmers in other, uh, in other regions. We're producing less and less of our staples, rice, maize, tomatoes. And you've got climate change breathing down our backs and it's affecting rainfall. And over the last 20 years, we've seen our yield 
drop by 45 percent. That as a 1986, over 50 percent of the Nigerian soil was not fertile for growing. Soils do die. You keep growing food on them. And chemical fertilizers may help, but they can also destroy the soil because they're actually a form of salt. You know what they're doing now? They go to your farm, take the microbes from your soil, separate the bad ones from the good ones, and multiply your microbes and put back in the soil. So you can actually correct soil. A lot of the seeds that you find in the country, they're not able to produce at optimal capacity. We bring them into the lab and we utilize something called tissue culture. We clean the seeds and what that does is ensures that, okay, a seed is not able to give us the maximum yield. When you're talking about mechanization, everybody thinks of large scale. One thing that uh, helped tremendously is hand planters. It's amazing how much it helped because now they can plant the right spacing, they can plant the right depth, and they can plant lots of rows a day without bending over, poking holes, and planting by hand. Jollof rice has always been that celebratory dish. It has flavor. It has just a hint of spice. It has rice, most importantly, that can stand up to the sauce. So the, the important thing with jollof rice is having a good balance between the rice and the tomato sauce it's cooked in. You don't have a pot of mush. You have individual, lovely, separate, fluffy, vibrantly colored grains of jollof rice. Nigerian jollof for the win. Why should we produce tomatoes that go to waste? Because we don't know how to process them. Nigeria is the largest importer of tomato paste in the world. In terms of the actual volume of tomato paste, it could fill the Empire State Building twice. The average yield in Nigeria for tomatoes is about five to seven tons per hectare. The global average yield is about 35 tons per hectare. The factory needs to buy tomatoes at a cost of, let's say, 80 to $100 a ton. But Nigerians can't produce at that cost it cost them $120 to $130 to make the tomatoes. A lot of people think that yield is solely determined by the variety, but actually there's a lot that goes into it. Plant spacing, irrigation, fertilizer application, seed variety, and pesticides are all important parts of helping the farm to be healthy and productive. We've had three seasons now, and every year we've doubled our yields. You know, Nigeria has the potential to be a major rice producer. Uh, if you look at today, the largest rice producer in the world is Thailand. Uh, Thailand sits between 4 degrees and 14 degrees uh, north of the equator. Nigeria sits exactly in that same band. The cost of production for foreign rice is a lot less than the cost of production for Nigerian rice. A lot of rice is manually harvested and constantly when it's manually harvested you get grains of stone, you get debris, you get uh, dirt in it. It's one area that government has focused policy recently to try and reduce or eliminate the importation of rice. The standards have increased as a result of the work they have done. So that has produced very good quality rice. We can definitely produce enough rice to feed the whole nation. I want to tell you now, say, abakaliki rice. No be waiting to be before where it be now. Today, no more stone in our rice. Our rice is stone-free, cost-free, and well-packaged. In Nigeria, we actually import more wheat than we do rice. Nigeria eats lots of bread. They need lots of wheat. Wheat production in the past in Nigeria has been mainly in the north because of the type of wheat that they raise takes cold weather. Borno, which was the major state, which probably had close to 400,000 hectares of wheat. Well, with the Boko Haram situation, no wheat is being grown. About three years ago, the best wheat in Nigeria was yielding around one, 1 1.5 tons per hectare. Then an organization called Ikarda, they brought some uh, excellent new wheat varieties that increased the yield from 1.5 tons to four or five tons. At those yield levels, wheat becomes very profitable. If this new wheat varieties come about, you'll see that they can grow wheat like rice, and you'll see the stop importation of wheat. Catfish pepper soup in Nigeria is known as point and kill. 
and then they make this incredibly fragrant broth of um, pepper soup that's seasoned with peculiar African or indigenous spices. And you just end up with this beautiful dish of creamy fish cut by spicy broth. Fish is the primary source of protein for the majority of people who live in the Niger Delta. Fishermen on the coastal waters are not only being confronted with impacts of global warming and salinization of, of freshwater systems, that means the, the marine ecosystem is being impacted by intrusion of seawater into freshwater system. That affects both the quality of the, the types of species we have, they're also affected by the high level of ecosystem degradation from oil pollution. People in the past would just go to the coastline, go to the mangroves and harvest them and have very healthy foods. Now all that is being challenged. Apart from that, even the periwinkles. The periwinkles grow a lot in the mangroves and periwinkles are very essential in the food system. Madam Periwinkle was a very big woman in terms of Previnkel business. But today you cannot see Previnkel again. Ah, oh, they manage my Previnkel company to do my own job, train my speaking, build my house, buy my lapa, do everything. It's the best company in this world. Before modern, everywhere. That Porto Porto where you they look at. We know they go far, you just enter that side. Take your two hand, pack up. Uh, as this thing don't pour the oil, no problem could again. If you enter that pot of water, you can't see any even one. Now the firewood are completely gone. Though it is firewood that you use in drying the fish. No mangrove again, because the, all the mangroves are completely dead. We need to adopt new and sustainable approaches to produce fish to meet demand. Aquaculture is a huge opportunity for Nigerians. We can meet our demand with investing in, in fisheries. Nigeria requires over 2.6 million metric tons of catfish. And the current production capacity here in Nigeria is above 40%, which means the market is there. The market is there. But the major problem is the high cost of production. Fish production requires a cold chain. It requires energy, it requires electricity, and we just don't have that. Fish farming can be a profitable business, but to get started, somebody needs, first of all, some clean water. We should have reservoir all along the streams. Fresh water. We have molecular filter now. It filters only pure water onto the reservoir. The most expensive thing in fish farming is the feed especially if you go uh, and buy the imported feed. So uh, a lot of uh, people now are looking into how do I produce my own feed? And uh, yeah, we have some formulas. The employment that will be created because you buy the fish food here in Nigeria. Farmers will have to increase their production of maize and soybean to make the fish food. Everything starts coming together. So yeah. In Nigerian street food, it's one of those things that cuts across every class in society. Every city and every town in Nigeria now has multiple suya joints. Uh, it's just that street food answer to a late evening, to, to grabbing a snack. Suya is the ultimate. According to the Nigerian Ministry of Agriculture, Lagos State is the largest consumer of Nigerian beef, 95% of which is raised by nomadic herdsmen in the north who often walk cattle thousands of kilometers to slaughter in the market. But a way of life is not always the most effective way to feed a nation. Land is scarce. Farmers and herdsmen often clash with deadly consequences. Nature can no longer provide water and pasture for livestock. Land and population have come together and caused the issues between pastoralists and farmers. Desification has compounded and exacerbated those issues. The grasslands of Nigeria can barely support maybe about 40% of Nigerian livestock. 
because of expanding cultivations, climate change, degradation of the rangelands have all depleted the grassland resources that Nigeria used to have. Climate change is having an effect. Once it dries up and the rain stops, cattle begin to move in from West Africa into Nigeria. It doesn't happen here alone. It happens in Cote d'Ivoire, in Ghana. I'm asking people to grow food, right? And I'm asking the headsman, okay, grow your cattle. We need your milk and your beef. But one department of agriculture doesn't have to become a problem for another. This system of just moving cattle around the country or around the entire West African region, around the Sahel, is not sustainable in the long run. There is crisis, there is land shortages, there is growing social anxiety, and there is growing social disorder that is negatively affecting the system of production. It used to be the farmer only farmed in the rainy season. So in the dry season, he wanted the cattle to eat up his crops and place the manure on the ground, and it made it easier for him to farm. But today, they're farming year round, so this is no longer viable. We can't keep up with the demand of the growing population at the rate at which we produce cattle. The country eats over 18,000 head of beef a day. So we need to do something radically to change our cattle production and transform it from a, an industry is dependent on uh, methods that are hundreds and hundreds of years old. We consume a lot of milk, a billion liters every year. If you ask those in Lagos, they probably have never taken fresh milk all their life. They are only used to milk that comes in can, either in powder form or in liquid form. We don't produce 2% of the meal requirement of the Nigerian population. But if we can improve that infrastructure that links you know, the milk producer and the market, then of course the preference and the consumption of, of fresh milk will increase with it. The local breeds can produce up to about a liter a day. Your average Holstein Frasian cow will give you a milk yield of up to 50 liters a day. To get higher production from your cattle, you need to feed them well. The solution to solve this problem is to bring in feedlots to where Fulani can sell their cattle in 18 months at twice the weight have 60% less cattle running on the grass, and now that all takes feed, which the farmer is going to provide. It's a win-win situation. It has to come to Nigeria. If you want to feed a single cow, you need two acres of land for one year. But with the same acre of land, you set up um, a path where they can grow their grasses in just seven days. Using further system, you can feed over 10,000 cows. So you grow them in layers such that when it is time for harvest, you just roll it off, take it to the feeding area for the animals and drop it, and you are done. Rico Gado in Yola is trying to change the way cattle are fed. We're presenting you with the proper way of feeding an animal, rather than just feed the animal whatever you have available to feed it. Not only are we less expensive than other foreign brands, we are as competitive in terms of quality. So we have 19.5 million cows in this country, roughly. The idea is that we should have groups of, of ranches which will now change to be a, a production center. 10, 20, 50, 30 ranches in one large community who can provide them security against rustlers but also supply them water and harvest milk and process the milk. How these cow owners rent a ranch? So we have a segment in where the cows are staying. Then you set up um, a path where they can grow their grasses in just seven days, the fodder system. And all of this together, you actually have your hospitals where you have your vet doctors to check the cows. It would have been able to solve the issue of the headmen and the farmers' clashes. Two, it will create employment. Our meat quality will be better because now we have health inspectors ensuring, oh, we have a choice in that place. In addition, the owners of the fodder system are able to get job, create income for themselves. Over time, you bring in schools and all of that such that you are able to create a whole new source of income for the nation.
I assure you that there is no pastoral family that will move his animals away from an area where there are pasture and there is water to anywhere else. Help farmers improve productivity, help pastoralists improve productivity within the same environments, share the benefits and share the resources. In this way, we are creating symbiotic relationship and great social harmony among the diverse communities that live in each of Nigeria's rural areas. The nations that are very rich happens to be the ones that process and add value to everything they produce. Well, the ones that are poor tends to be the ones that are stuck at the bottom of the value chain. They export raw materials, they don't finish the products that they produce. And so I really believe that for agriculture to be totally transformed, we must totally have agricultural industrialization. So we shouldn't be focusing just on production. We should focus on developing full value chains for everything that we do. The food processing companies are located in the cities. I've been advocating for a total structural transformation of our rural economy through what I call staple food crop processing zones, where you will give incentives for the food and agribusinesses to locate in rural areas. They will have access to infrastructure, power, water, roads, and ICT infrastructure and irrigation. Then those areas become areas where they actually buy massive amount of produce from farmers. They create markets for farmers, they process and add value to everything there in the rural economy. And the only thing that you will find living those rural economies will be finished products. Youth uh, in Nigeria basically have a negative attitude about going into agriculture and going into farming. And uh, they're right, they're exactly right. You look at their parents or their grandparents and how they were doing agriculture. It's not a great life, it, uh, it's poverty, it's hard work, and so what you're seeing is that youth in unmass are migrating from rural areas to urban areas. It may seem that youth are not interested in agriculture at the moment. It's basically because the way it's been practiced over the years and the way it's been you know, tutored down to us. We just thought about agriculture as production. Are we producing more? We didn't think about when we produce, how do we process? How do we add value to what we produce? How do we market? There are huge potential there and huge opportunity for young people to find a job. I think with such a young population in Nigeria, if we invest in that, the sky's the limit. Commercial farms need engineers, accountants, office managers, mechanics. I mean, the entire gamut of professional opportunities arise there. You don't have to even own a farm. You can make bags. You can have a plastic factory. You can supply fertilizers. You can start a tractor hire service. You can market people's products for them. A start a seed company to provide high quality seed to farmers. Set up an agro dealership in a hundred small villages. Uh, there's all kinds of things that businesses can be set up to make the food system in Nigeria efficient. And all the great things that are happening to improve the nutrition and the health and the employment of people is making everybody have better incomes too. The size of the food and agriculture market on this continent by 2030 is going to be a whopping $1 trillion. That tells me that the future millionaires and the billionaires of Africa are not going to come from oil and gas industry. They're going to come from the agriculture sector, but they're going to come from a sector that focuses on agriculture as a business, not as a way of life. I was trained as a doctor to be a cardiologist, but here I am as a farmer and a proud one at it. It's a profitable business. It's something that brings me joy, that creates opportunities for people in the rural environment and also creates opportunity for my investors as well. We are young people from all varieties of professions are making uh, agriculture a business. Lots of young people in Nigeria with great ideas need to begin to look at food as an opportunity for the future, growing food, urban farming, creative farming. And one of the things we can do for ourselves as individuals is ensure we adopt urban farming to ensure that we can produce our foods right in the city, as opposed to waiting for kilometers and miles away to bring the food down to the city. Hunger is not seasonal, so food production cannot be seasonal. It's all soilless technology generally. You can grow crop any time of the year. You can maximize your space. You can do without the use of insecticide, herbicide, 
Our first success was with yam for the aeroponics. We were able to do it for 200 different other crops. Tomatoes in soil normally take 90 days. We do it in about 35 to 45 days. So aeroponics reduces the time to harvest. Through our agricultural technologies, we have higher rates of flavonoids and antioxidants, especially our crops grown in the aeroponics systems. So aside from ensuring food security and food self-sufficiency, we also want to ensure that the food people are eating is actually healthy. When you have the plant in the aeroponic system, when you are growing without the soil element, the plants do not compete for nutrients. You can jump pack them as close as possible, such that they only need space for growth. When you are growing in soil, you can only have one layer of plant growing. But when you are growing without soil, you can have multiple layers because all you need to do is create multiple support structures. The screeners has the aeroponic system in place that has about 11,000 plantlets. The capacity of that in the next eight, nine months is three million tubers coming out of there. With this partial evaporator system, we are able to cool the greenhouse to whatever temperature we want it to go to. So this works like a normal cooling system. However, the cold air produced here is pushed into the greenhouse through the ventilation systems that we have put inside. And all the materials used are locally made. Fresh Direct is an urban farm. We use technology and agriculture. So we wanted to think about doing greenhouse farming in the city and we realized that the space is not enough for the amount that we want to produce. And so we were trying to think of what is stackable and we decided, hey, we'll do hydroponic farming in containers rather than doing them in the greenhouses that we had. So we went from having just one container to two containers to now we have 10 containers that we're fabricating right now. We're able to give the plant the best of everything that it needs, but we're also able to control the light that it gets, the nutrients that it gets, and make sure that it's optimum. It's just like a child. When you have a child, you feed it the best, you give it the best, your child grows up to be big and healthy. The same thing with our plants. Women are an integral part of any strategy for food security. Well, women today are involved in agriculture in Nigeria. Those that do the back-breaking work are our women. Women do end up playing quite a big role in terms of the labor that goes into farm work. Um, it's unfortunate that despite the fact that they contribute so much to the work, they don't necessarily get to decide what happens to the money. So you cannot go far unless you have empowerment of women, especially in the agricultural sector. Everything we plant for agriculture, we must think of the role of women because they are the center of production, of processing of many of our crops. As we are modernizing, as we're becoming more aware of the effect of um, food production in the environment and climate change, is take women along with you. We are mobilizing three billion US dollars at the African Development Bank, specifically for the businesses of women in Africa. So get women issues right in agriculture, get the youth issues right, get the structure of agriculture right in the rural economy, get the private sector to invest in it, and at the end of it, get the lenses, the right lenses, look at it as a business for creating massive amount of wealth. To be food secure, we must be climate resilient. There is no time. We must ensure that every person, every day, no matter who or where, is guaranteed safe, sufficient and nutritious meals. It's a shame that we import so much of our food. We've relied so heavily on the money that we've made as a country from oil and from petroleum. And so um, the solution really is to be self-sufficient. Nigeria need to act immediately to address the challenges of food security. My major concern and worry is whether we will act the right way. If we continue with the low productivity approaches we have now, then we're going to have serious problems but we are totally capable of feeding ourselves. I think a holistic approach to it, that it's not just about producing food, it's a full cycle. Um, and so therefore, is the infrastructure there? Do we have access? Are the markets there? Are women involved in this? Is there um, education being brought in in a way that empowers people so that we get the maximum use from it? Um, I think that's been the major challenge. It's not joined up. You cannot always wait for the government to do things. The people that you call government, they have tenure, but being a citizen of Nigeria is a life thing. So except the majority is willing to change, nothing would happen. The government is not going to help you ensure that you do not waste food in your houses. 
The government is not going to help you ensure that you do things that are pro-environment. It is only us that can do that. We live in a country where we throw dirt on the streets and complain that the government did not pick it up. But we need to start now and start looking at it seriously as an opportunity. Something that actually gives value to society, that solves the country's most fundamental problems as a generational mission, because that's what it is. It's a big, big challenge for this generation. For us to protect our ecosystem, to tackle global warming, to keep our food diversity, we need to support agriculture that works in harmony with nature. The weather, the land, the people, the water, it's all here. All we have to do is put it together and make it happen. If we will be sober, uh, sensible, and consistent in keeping and paying attention to food security, we do what we should do, starting from now. We can do it. Thank you.